At 3 o'clock in the morning, the phone rang. It was the community in Guayaquil, and they told us that there had been a really big earthquake, that the school building in Playa Prieta had collapsed with the sisters inside. The first thing that came to my mind was, I have to wake up all the sisters to pray. The next day, we first received news that they were all out. But later, in another phone call, we were told that not all of the sisters were out, but only three sisters and two girls, and that five girls and Sister Claire were still missing. When I heard that she was the only one missing, I said, they're not going to find her alive. Because you could tell that she was already prepared, that her heart was no longer attached to the things down here. She was way above all this. So many memories come to mind when she first arrived to the community. Her novitiate, her first vows, her time in the different communities. There are so many memories that come to mind. Ever since I met Sister Claire, I was always impressed by how clearly she would hear the voice of God speaking in her heart, in her soul, and also by how quickly and with what generosity she responded to Him. She couldn't do things halfway. When she did something, she did it to the best of her ability, with all of her strength, keeping nothing back for herself. When I saw Sister Claire do things, she really was all or nothing. drama queen always was from the day in her she was born. Brilliant, she got on with anybody. She could mix with anybody in the world, like just so kind and very good personality. Always had people around her, always. She had the best personality, full of life. If you met her, you just got on with her straight away. Nothing bothered her, she just took everything in her stride. She was so lively, bubbly, always upbeat. When she was in a class, she'd away, her presence just took over the class. Everyone enjoyed her. Everyone wanted and loved to be in her company. I'm from Catholic there, but my family aren't Catholic for religious reasons. It's for like political reasons. Because in the north of Ireland, well, there's a lot of problems, Catholics against the Protestants. But they're not fighting for reasons, for religious reasons. They fight politically because the Catholics want a united Ireland the, and the Protestants want to be joined on their brothers. It's more a question of politics. I'm Irish too, same as Sister Claire. I'm a lot older than her. She was born in Derry City in the north of Ireland. I was born in Cork City in the south of Ireland. Even in my own childhood, I remember six or seven years, I would have been seven when Bloody Sunday happened and the tension in the air, I remember that clearly. In 1980, I would have been 15, and, and we lived the hunger strike of the Republican Catholic prisoners looking for political status as prisoners, which was denied to them. I remember there was a lot of anger, murderous hatred that was in the air at the time. And uh, the two centers of tension, the two great centers of tension, would have been the Falls Road in Belfast and uh, the Bogside in Derry, which is right next to the Brandywell, which, which is where Sister Claire was from. There was a lot of violence here, and you couldn't just walk down the street. If you heard shooting, you knew that they knew you lay down on the ground. If you heard a bomb going off and it seemed to be close, their father used to go out and get them. Because you, you didn't know, you know, you didn't know just what would happen and Claire's seen a soldier being blew up. She's come from school. So that's the environment. The statistics are that, so of sociological studies and so on, that the rates of vandalism, of illiteracy, of violence, of unemployment, of homelessness among the youths and young adults of Derry throughout that time were higher than anywhere else in Ireland or Britain. 
So the legacy of, of destruction uh, is something that she would have lived, you know, very close up. What I find extraordinary is that she transcended all of that, if you like, just on a, on a natural level. Just by the sheer talent, abundance of natural talent, she succeeded in opening her wings, so to speak, and surpassing all of that, escaping it. School, everybody talked about. You no know, one's school shows and schools got because she was always brilliant. She always had the lead role, she always, but she was brilliant. She loved her acting, like everything was about her acting. Oh, every day of her life was about being an actress. It's not something that just happened, it was done her whole life. She just, that was her. And then um, she was doing something in school and there was an um, agent was up the school and seen her. He said, would you come, you know, do my acting classes? And she went and she could parts, you know, and films and advertisements. At the age of 15, she had that position as a, as a presenter on a, on a programme for young people on Channel 4, out of nothing. You know, we're not talking about nowadays, it's kind of a closed shop often. The children of famous people get to become actors and singers and so on, just kind of living off, feeding off the legacy of those who went before them and kind of blazed the trail. But in Sister Claire's case, it was pure, natural talent and lots of it. And, and not only is acting, singing and comedy, she had it all. How did she walk away from all of that? That's why I mention this, because it becomes even more amazing. The fact that having escaped a difficult, uh, difficult circumstances because of her talent and having gotten on that inside track to, to fame and success and, and prosperity, you know, money and lots of it and attention, that she was able to walk away from all of that. En mi vida siempre ha sido o todo o nada, o actriz famosa o nada, o blanco y negro, ¿no? Y... Y también se puede decir que he buscado el amor en sitios donde no lo he encontrado. He tenido novios, he tenido muchas amigas, amigos, eh, mucho éxito en el campo del teatro, de, he hecho una película, eh, presentadora y todo esto, ¿no? Pero yo sentí que, que no me llenaba. En los años 90, el año 2000, around that time, the home of the mother, asked could they come and speak to our youth group. So I agreed instantly that the priests and sisters could come and speak to our group. As a result of that, Sister Claire was invited to go to Spain. When I was um, 17, I started drinking. And I liked to party, I smoked, all that kind of stuff. And one time one of my friends, her name was Sharon, she called me up and she said, Claire, do you want to go to Spain? Because uh, there was this free trip to Spain. And she told me that there was going to be uh, a group of people that were going to She said, all the people that are going to go to Spain are going to meet up in this house next week. I said that I would go, that I was going to go to Spain, and I thought we were going to go to Spain to party. That's what I thought. I thought we were going to go to a place called Ibiza. She didn't say that to me, but that's what I thought in my head. That we were going to go there, we were going to party, we were going to drink, all that kind of stuff. A few weeks before the trip, everything was booked and arranged. And a few weeks before, um, my appendix perforated, helping my mommy put up curtains wasn't able to go obviously I was in recovery so um, I decided you know one of them approached me and said would you like anyone to go in your place so the first person that came to mind was Claire. She thought it was party 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 my mom is not here my dad is not here. We went to Ireland to meet with a group of people from Derry who were going to come down to our Holy Week retreat. It was during this meeting in Derry with us that she realized that it was a pilgrimage, not a tourist trip to Spain. You opened the door and there was this group of people, about 20, 30 people, they were 40, 50, 60 years old, all sitting there with rosaries. Are you all going to Spain? And they say, yeah, we're going to the pilgrimage. I said, you're going to what? <laughs> Let's just say she came a little reluctantly. Now looking back in hindsight, was not a was not a coincidence. It was definitely a God incident. Uh, this was a last minute replacement. In the home of the mother, we usually have what we call a Holy Week encounter. That year, we got together in Priego, Spain, and a small group of young girls came from Ireland. One of them was Claire Crockett, a very lively girl, very energetic. 
and very sure of herself. Rambunctious, very rowdy. She loved to make others laugh, but she didn't like to think. I looked out the window and I saw Claire Crockett there, sunbathing, and it wasn't even hot. But I do remember how the first impression that you might have had of her, of being superficial, wasn't authentic. Rather, she was a person that truly sought the truth. Whenever Father Rafael would speak, she was completely receptive. She was really listening. Good Friday came, and uh, they said, Claire, you have to go. Today's Good Friday. Our Lord died for us. You have to go. Blah, blah, blah. So I went in. I said, fine. I sat on the back bench of the church. And they said, Claire, you have to get up. You're just a cross. You know, everybody's doing it. Get up. I said, I'm just going to Get up. Claire, you got to So I got up because everybody else was doing it. And I remember standing in line waiting to kiss a cross. It didn't mean anything to me. I went up and as I went to kiss the feet of our Lord, I remember looking at him and in that moment I just felt the mercy of God and I saw that it was my sins that nailed our Lord to the cross. No, no one had ever told me that, but looking at our Lord on the cross, I just saw that they were my sins that nailed him to the cross and I just started crying and crying. For my drunkenness, for my impurity, for my, for my vanity, for everything, I seen him nailed on the cross for that, that these were the nails, that I nailed him to the cross, it was my fault. And seeing this, and seeing the love that he had for me, that dying on the cross for me, I was like, I have to change. I can't go on love, no, I am love. I went up to her and I asked her how she was doing. She looked at me and she responded, he loves me, he died for me. And I asked her, are you okay? And she kept repeating that over and over again. So I asked her if she wanted to speak with Father Raphael, and she said yes. We went to the sacristy, and it was then that I asked her, and right away, she said that she wanted to be a nun. I told her that to become a nun like the sisters, that she would have to come back. And she said, well, I'll come back. But she had a problem because she also wanted to be famous, and so she said that she could be a famous nun. Later, she told everyone this. Today, we were talking about uh, vocations, and I was thinking, oh my god, I've got a vocation, but I want to become famous. A lawyer ago, I was all, I want to become a nun too. So then I said to myself, oh, I'll become a famous nun. So I don't know what to do with myself now. I could become really famous and be really rich. Or I could come here and I pray to God that I make the right decision. Gracias! Initially she struggled with her two vocations because I have to be a nun and I have to be famous, so the solution is I'm going to be a famous nun. But uh, as she went further and further into the journey, the whole fame thing became less and less important to her. And it was totally eclipsed by the vocation to just love and to live and, and proclaim the truth. And that was all she cared about in the end. She went back to Ireland, of course, when Holy Week was over. And some of the sisters said, she won't come back. But I said, yes, she'll come back. Afterwards, she came on a pilgrimage to Rome that Father invited her to. He was very interested in her coming, and he invited her, and she came on the pilgrimage to Rome. And of course, she came with the attitude of a normal girl, superficial and fooling around. She spoke about having a vocation, and what surprised me the most was that Father Raphael took her seriously. He saw something in her and trusted her, and he really did believe that she had a vocation. Are you sure? Are you here, Can you see me now? Can you hear this all there? That's all! Is that alright? We ended up going to the home of the mother together on a pilgrimage for three weeks. And I feel very privileged because I was there for what I think was the light bulb moment in Claire's journey. We are a temple for his throne. Heaven is in my heart. Santa Clara de Assis. Where is your Santa Santa? Um, it's my Saint's feast day today, Saint Clara of Assisi. <laughs> Adios! Our Lord said to me, Clara, I want you to live like one of the sisters. I want you to live in poverty, chastity, and obedience. I think it was that moment that my eyes started twitching like that. <laughs> and I said, Lord, I can't do that. I can't, I can't be poor. I can't. And I was giving them all these reasons that I, I could live like a sister, I couldn't do that, that it was impossible, I was going to be famous, God, did you not know I was going to be famous? Um, but I, I remember our Lord saying to me, if I ask you to do this, I'll give you the strength and the grace to be able to do it. 
that light bulb moment was the start of her realizing that this was something within her that she really desired, that this was what her life purpose was. I remember one of the sisters telling us about how before she had became a nun, she had gone out with boys and done the whole thing. And I remember that being a great uh, giggle between us because Claire was fond of the boys and having a wee drink as well and having a wee smoke and it was like, oh God, I'm gonna have to give all this up. I don't know if this is gonna be as easy as I thought. She came every two seconds. And since I didn't know English, Sister Elena came to translate. So she came smoking and she smoked like this and said, I, I'm going to become a nun and I'm going to be a famous nun. I told her, well, yes, I think that you're going to become a famous nun, but to become a famous nun, you will have to be the most humble and to be the most humble, you will have to learn to obey. Then she took a puff of her cigarette and said, well then, I'll obey. That was the kind of character that sister had. You see, she had a character of totality. And again, I said during this, this pilgrimage, I was like, I am changing. And then I went home and I didn't change. <laughs> so for a year then, I was having this, then this year then when I went home and I said I was going to change, this is the year that I love the worst because this is the year where I got drunk and so, where I dr got drunk every Saturday or whatever and then it turned on to getting drunk every day and then it turned on I had to go to hospital because I got drunk. And I wanted the world and I wanted to love my life but God wouldn't let me. It was like I don't want you there, I want you for me, I want you loving poverty, chest and obedience. Now when I look back on it, I thought that I was happy but I wasn't happy. And there was, there was one night that I was there and I was drinking and I went down to the bathroom and I remember I was sitting in the cubicle thing in the bathroom. I, I, was, I remember looking down because I thought I was going to be sick. I was drunk. And um, I felt all of a sudden that someone was looking at me. The presence that I felt was so strong that I remember looking up because I thought there was someone in the other toilet cubicle looking over at me. I remember looking up going, who was looking at me? And all of a sudden I felt um, strongly these, these words in my heart, why do you keep hurting me? I knew that our Lord was right there. He was looking at me. And um, I saw once again that I was crucifying our Lord with all the sins, you know, with my drunkenness, with all the mortal sins that I was committing, that I was nailing our Lord once again to the cross. Another experience that was very strong that I had was when I was doing the movie, I had to go to, to England to do it. Now, when you're doing a movie, you have a lady that does your makeup, you have a lady that, you know, opens your, the car door for you, you have another one that's on your coat and all that. They put you up in the best hotels, they take you to the best restaurants. I had all that. At nighttime, what we would do, we'd go out with the directors and the actors, and we would go to a restaurant and we would eat and stuff. Because I had got so drunk the night before, I said, you know what, the next night I'm not going to go out, so I actually didn't. I went back to my hotel room. I remember sitting on top of my hotel bed and I'm looking at my schedule for the next day that said, you know, the chauffeur would come and pick me up at 7.30 and all that. I remember looking at it and I just started crying and crying. And I remember crying for hours and hours and I couldn't stop. I was thinking to myself, why am I crying? Why are you crying, Claire? You know what? You've got everything. I knew that by doing this part of the movie that, that I could, you know, go up this ladder of success, that I was going to get more parts. I knew that. But I felt that I had, I had achieved everything and at the same time I had nothing. I had nothing within me. I knew that I had to change my life. I knew that I had to cut. With, with everything that was taken away from God. I, I knew that only doing what he told me to do and what he asked of me, that was the only way I was going to fill that hole up. That was the only way I was going to fill it up. And so she completely cut with making films, which was the great immolation of her life. The great immolation of her life was to say, either God or the world. Since I prefer God, I don't want anything else. Because I fell in love with God. I fell in love with Jesus Christ. I fell in love with Him. Because, what can I say, that He stole my heart. And my motivation was this, to be united with God forever. With a cigarette in this hand and a beer in the other. So guess what? I'm, I'm going to be a nun. Shock, just in total shock with her. Because of the way she loved her life, like, you know what I mean? And I always thought that she would be 
and filmed somewhere on a longer line on Life Like. We laughed it off. We thought she's going to go there, she'll be back next week. She'll never last. We actually came up with a few things that she was already partying, she was like nun days, or she met somebody she was already loving Spain. We never actually believed that she was going to be a nun. We didn't want her to go to Spain, we wanted her here. You know, I remember saying there, you're ruining your life. See the day she was going out the door to go to Spain, they, you know, to be a nun. I be I was down on my hands and knees, begging her, begging her, please don't go, please don't go. And she said, I'm going. I saw that our Lord called me to leave everything, and with his, his strength and his grace, and with the intercession and the help of our Holy Mother, I was able to do that. Of course, you, have, you love your country, you love your family, um, but God is worth all of that. Even I felt that our Lord was asking me to go to Spain. But I remember saying to our Lord, why are you taking me out of my country? I can't speak the language. And my mom, she was so upset about it. You know, one day I want to be a famous actress, the next day I'm going to be a nun. She's like, what is going on with my daughter? And I remember saying to our Lord, what's happening? You have to leave everything. And he said, you leave everything so that you'll find me, but I will be your mother, your father, your language, and your country. You know, I, in other words, I'll be everything for you. When Sister Claire arrived and entered as a candidate, her spiritual and human formation began. She learned Spanish and she did so with great facility because it's true, she had a very good ear. And in the candidacy, well, she received the formation of a candidate. She found it difficult, you know, it wasn't that she entered and that she was a very holy, you know, straight away, like she came here with all her worldly vices. For example, in regards to working, physical work, she wasn't big into physical work, I remember. She had grown up in an environment of hatred and violence and had to go from violence to love, serenity and peace. That isn't done from one day to another, just as the conversion of a woman who had high hopes of becoming a famous Hollywood actress doesn't happen from one day to another. En ser una actriz famosa de Hollywood. She was a docile soul, and so we saw how the Lord worked in her and took away from her everything that wasn't proper to a religious. And then all of the virtues began to grow, all of the gifts that she had. I remember how at the beginning she loved to draw attention to herself. We would all be talking, and all of a sudden she would walk into the dining room and, hey, here I am, because Sister Claire had arrived. But later on, gradually, all of that started to disappear. And on the contrary, she always wanted to go unnoticed. One of the things that Sister Claire always had, even as a candidate, even though it was more purified, because maybe there was pride involved as a candidate, but she had a very, she was so strong-willed and she was so determined. When she saw something, she went for it. Right after Sister Claire arrived in Spain, her manager called her several times trying to convince her to come back. He told her to come back, that she was wasting her life. Her manager was very convinced of her talent that she could reach Hollywood. And she spoke about it with a sense of humor, but you could tell that it was a battle for her. She always, always remained faithful. And it was very difficult for her because there were still a lot of ties of affection and experiences and it was such that it attracted her and wanted to lead her to the other side. I met Sister Claire when I was 14 years old. I was seven, and it was during the Home of the Mother summer camp in 2002. She was always fooling around. She always encouraged me in everything, and even when she saw that I distanced myself a little from the other girls because I miss my parents and all that, and she, without asking me or anything, realized what was wrong. During one of the campfires, since she didn't know Spanish, she couldn't be in the skit or anything. But she played the role of a hen. A real hen. <laughs> she gave us acting classes, and we had to act out scenes from everyday life with little sacrifices that we could make for Jesus and the Virgin Mary. And she added a touch of humor to it and made everything really fun, even though it was really embarrassing to do at that moment and I didn't feel like it. In the end, I had a great time. Any 
time you're with Sister Claire, we, there was always a laugh, there was always a joke. She brought joy to all our conversations. So you were always guaranteed to have a, have a good time with Sister Claire. She played the role of two characters, and it was great. One was a little boy, and the other a little girl. We were amazed by the gestures. She used to act like a boy from a sketchy neighborhood with a runny nose. And I spoke to her with Carlitos, the role she played. And I would say things like, Carlitos, where have you been today? And then she would begin to tell me, and it was hilarious. Vas a decir algo, Carlitos, a las hermanas que se van. Hermanas, que tiene que ser muy buenas ahí en Ecuador. Y también, cuando vais a Ecuador, si puedes comprarnos algunos regalos. After two years, she entered the novitiate, a ceremony in which the habit is received and one begins to live in a clearer way the consecrated life as a servant sister. She was available for any kind of work. She was a little bit clumsy, but her disposition was above all that. And since she had a good disposition, if you told her, no, not like that, she would joke about it, but then she would do it. She changed and she did what she had to do. Precisely by assuming all of those things that were so different from her way of being, you could see that she was willing to die to herself and take on her new way of life, what the Lord was asking of her. During the novitiate, there is always a month of spiritual exercises. And so during the month of exercises, she received a very big grace, which was to be fully aware of the fact that she was nothing, that she was nothing and he was everything, he's God. And so that grace was what later on helped her to put all of the gifts that she had, that she had received from God, obviously, well, to put them all at the service of God. After the novitiate, she took her first vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And in the Servant Sisters, we take a fourth vow of defending the Eucharist in and with our life, and of defending the honor of our mother, especially in the privilege of her virginity, in and with our life. I acabo de hacer votos de primer año y estoy muy contenta. Y la verdad es que tengo que dar muchas gracias a Dios por este don muy grande que me ha dado, la don de la vocación, y especialmente con las siervas. The day right after making her vows, she went to her first assignment. She spent a few months in our community in Belmonte, and I have to say that I was very impressed by the way she acted there, because it made me realize that she had truly adapted to what our life is as servant sisters, in the way that she treated the girls, and how she led the catechism classes that she was asked to give. And in October, we founded a new community in the United States, in Jacksonville. Sister Claire was among the four sisters that we had uh, that began the ministry here um, for our school. We've recently actually just come to Assumption Parish at the Catholic school, the Assumption Catholic school. We're helping the kids out there given spiritual formation during the religion classes. We go in and we talk to the kids and stuff like that. The first impression I had of Sister Claire was just exuberant joy. There was, there was no way that you could not be impacted by her uh, contagious smile and her love of the Lord and her love of our Blessed Mother. She came into the classroom and she wanted to be able to relate to these children. So she would come up with different songs and she would play games with them. She would do retreats with the, the girls as well. I was very impressed by the way she treated the children and how much they loved her. Many times she came back home with her habit all stained by the dirty hands of the children. Through her, the children grew closer to Jesus and to Mama Mary. I first met Sister Claire when I was in first grade. Six years old. Seven years old in second grade. We always look forward to Sister Claire's class. All the kids loved her, so it was fun. We Just seeing how lively and energetic she was really helped me to um, learn more about Christ. Yeah, I wanted to be like her. I wanted to show my love 
just like she did through being joyful. You just wanted what she had. She was just so happy and so joyful and I just, I just wanted it. I just desired it. I think a lot of us did and I'll never forget all those sister retreats, all the times after mass when I would run to the back of the church to go see Sister Claire at the table. and. When Sister Claire came to Assumption, she initiated taking the classes to adoration and we started practicing um, how to genuflect and how to kneel in the church before we went into the Adoration Chapel. And they would sing and they would pray. The enthusiasm that she had for Eucharist was caught by the kids, you know. She exuded that enthusiasm for the Lord. And after you've been exposed to her, you know that you have to pick up that enthusiasm. It was just so catchy. And we say that we put them in front of our Lord and we say, you know what, don't say anything for three minutes. Don't look anywhere. Don't start counting the flowers. Don't start looking at your neighbor's nose. You know, just for three minutes, just look at the Blessed Sacrament. Because in those three minutes, our Lord can touch you. I see that, you know, and our Lord, I'm sure that he gives a lot of graces to the hearts of the kids. Before we, the bell rang for the end of school, we would like to go there and just spend a few minutes with God and uh, having our own personal conversation. She would just always remind us, you know, listen to what Jesus has to tell you. Like, of course, you know, talk to him and everything, but make sure you listen. She was with the children preparing for their first communion. She would come at least once a week and teach us about the sacrament and what we were preparing ourselves for. She really drove in deep the meaning of the Eucharist and how it really is Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity. We're not just receiving a piece of bread because that was a lot for us to get at the time. Emphasize the importance of making our souls very clean before we receive Jesus and going to confession. And not just because you have to, it's because you want to. You want to be forgiven. You want to receive Jesus respectfully. and She put it in terms of like our soul is a house and when Jesus comes and visits us we want to clear all the cobwebs and clean up the house best we could. And she really emphasized the, how important it was to avoid sin at all costs. Like if there's one thing I remember is just how she would wave her finger and just say you should never commit mortal sin. Because of the way that she talked about Jesus in the sacrament of the Eucharist like it just made me thirst for him. I just wanted him. And but Sister Claire really taught us it was very important to be uh, reverent and very uh, respectful. Their devotion was very surprising. She had spoken to them about not giving importance to the pictures, not to look at mom and dad. Those children, when they went up to receive communion, when they processed in, I've never seen anything like it. It was like the Holy Spirit came over them and they hung their heads and they walked in so humble. the boys and girls in second grade, they wanted to do something more for, for the love of Mary. Sister Claire loved to pray the rosary, so me and a couple of the other kids that, you know, were really close with her, we'd go after school for, you know, 20, 30 minutes and we'd pray the rosary. And it was me and a lot, and a few of my other friends, and then we got a lot of other kids to come. The Rosary Club definitely helped me grow closer to Mama Mary. Everybody usually look, uh, loved to look forward to it. We remember her racing us in the field where we actually used to do these sprints to the Mother Mary statue um, out under the tree. I think being there and just saying it aloud with all the other kids really helped. Doing Rosary Club every week, uh, I'd go to my mom and I'd be like, Mom, when you start praying the Rosary. So all the things that my family does now is, is because of what Sister Claire instilled in me when I was young. Wait, this is a message from Mr. Jacob Wagner, my longtime pal. The sister told me you're not an assumption anymore, but that the Rosary Club goes on. I want you to remember, Mr. Wagner, that you are the founder of the Rosary Club. I don't know if you remember when you were little, um, how you used to stand outside the door and be like the, the bodyguard of the chapel, you know? Jacob Wagner, this is my message for you. Be faithful to what you know you have to do deep in your heart. It was awesome to know that she still remembered. Our summers were always full of activities to bring young people to Jesus Christ. It was great doing apostolate with Sister Claire because she had a really big and generous heart. 
My uh, first encounters with Sister Claire was when I was 13 and I went to a summer camp. When I was 11 years old, I was 13. She definitely made me feel welcome. And just her life and her joy and <laughs> the way she could just make anyone laugh. Her example and some of the other sisters just being so down to earth and funny, like, made you want to come back. But they also could relate to you and were real with you and were not what the media portrays sisters and nuns to be. Just watching her is, is just an incredible experience because she's just a holy, full of life, full of love, full of laughter person that she just automatically draws everybody around her. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our skit is called the Georgia Photo Album. Nearby, and took a picture of the sisters and our reaction. This was the photo. <laughs> My favorite memory of Sister Clay was in 2008, I was able to do a pilgrimage with the sisters. We went to New York, Canada, and Philadelphia. Can you tell us what is this over here? Here's the Niagara Falls. Yes. And uh, we're getting a little bit wet here. You heard it here first. If you bring clothes that you need to wash, you've been traveling long, bring them here to Niagara Falls. You can wash them. I had felt very strongly the call to enter as a servant sister. So I was fighting with that decision. In all of the car rides, I would talk a lot with Sister Claire, just seeing how happy she was in her surrender to the Lord and with what strength she was living it was a huge help for me and it was a wake-up call. Hey, here we are, live again. We are not now in Niagara Falls. We are not eating, but we are here um, outside this beautiful house with um, our dear friends. Um, we just arrived in our vehicle. Um, I drove this. Um. So one night, at the dinner table, we were talking about the activities that we were going to do the following year. And all of a sudden, we thought of Ireland. Sister Claire, why not do a pilgrimage to Ireland? All the American girls love Ireland. Where are we going? Waterford. All right. Amen. Amen. Let's hear it. Let me hear it. Amen. 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 She was just really fun to be around. Like, I loved it when she was with us. Like, she's just so selfless and entertaining and just. You just never thought about herself. In addition to leading you to God, she made herself very approachable so that you could talk to her about whatever you wanted. To begin with, you didn't feel judged when you told her about something, about anything. She had no problem saying things the way they were. I remember how in Ireland, she spoke to us a lot about chastity and above all, about thinking more about others than yourself. Where she saw sin, she was, no, that, you know, and she, she was very clear, she was very clear. And one might think that the girls would have you know, gotten frightened or might have said, well, she's too intense or over the top, you know? And on the contrary, the girls were always gathered around her any chance they had, but not because she was looking to be the center, but because I think she was a light for them. I remember like all of Ireland was so beautiful and green and mountainous. And then we get to Derry and there's like graffiti everywhere and like all the fences are covered in barbed wire. She introduced us to her family, to her sisters, her mother, her father. I didn't understand it all. I had to have Sister Claire translate English for me. This is only a small house. They were under the stairs. They were in the back hall. They were everywhere. My Sister Claire was so touched by seeing all of her family. I remember she like started crying. So we just all started singing the song for everyone, you know, and then she kind of shared her story with her family. And that was the first time Claire spoke about her calling, spoke about being a nun, how, how she became to be a nun. But from that, you kind of get a wee bit of comfort. We never really got used to the idea, but we knew why she went then. After that, I asked her, don't you worry about your family, like, because you're not with them? And she just repeated the words that God said to St. Catherine of Siena. And he said, if you take care of my things, I'll take care of your things. And she was like, I'm taking care of God's things now, and so I'm not worried at all. I'm, he's going to take care of all of my things. Y ahora voy a hacer votos perpetuos y esto es para mostrar que el Señor me está, Él es fiel, ¿no? Y Él me está llamando a la fidelidad en el amor para, para siempre. siempre. 
y yo estoy dispuesto a amarle para siempre, no con un amor, aunque mi amor es muy pobre y muy débil, pero yo sé que si me, me pongo en sus manos, él me dará la fuerza para amarle como, como debo amarle ¿no? y dar la vida por él. Yo, hermana Ángel María de la Trinidad y del Corazón de María, me consagro totalmente al Señor, tal cual soy, me doy a ti ahora y por siempre, como sierva del hogar de la madre. Your motto is going to be this. Alone, with Christ alone. Alone, with Christ alone. Is because she was the only one who made perpetual vows that year. But it also has another connotation, because in the encounter she had that Good Friday with Christ crucified, she was alone with Him, only with Him. Santo con Cristo crucificado fue a solas con el solo. Yo he visto lo que él ha hecho por mí y digo, Señor, me dejas sin palabras, de verdad. O sea, si tú has muerto por mí, ¿cómo no voy a morir a mí misma? She was well happy. She was, she was really happy. And we thought then she cried a lot through her voice. So after, like, we cried, and then we thought, oh, I wonder if she's crying because is she regretting this? And, But then she told us that, she said, I said I was never going to cry, but she said I cried because I was so happy that I was doing it. No, I wasn't crying because I was sad. She said I was just crying because I was finally getting to do it and how happy she was doing it. Sister Claire was extremely generous. She was a great soul. We could say that she was magnanimous. There was nothing that held her back. <laughs> We were about to open a new house in Valencia, and so she went with three other sisters. In Valencia, she had already made her perpetual vows, and she had done so with a seriousness, shall we say, typical of how she was. She was very authentic. During that time, I especially remember her obedience and willingness. She always said that in the morning, she signed a blank check for the Lord, and that on that blank check, he could write whatever he wanted and break her plans. And another thing she used to say that really caught my attention, was that sometimes I had to ask her for something that I knew could change a little her plans or that could be particularly difficult. Sister Claire, could you do this? Her answer was, of course. As though to say, obviously, God can ask me anything at any time. The Archbishop had given us the assignment to help as chaplains in some of the hospitals, and she helped in one of the hospitals for long-term and terminal illnesses. La ayudante de un hospital para enfermos de larga duración o enfermos terminales. They open doors for us because there are patients who, when they see a chaplain, they get a little scared. On the other hand, to see some young sisters, it seems like it's easier for them to accept them. From the time she came, she brought some joy to the patients because we have patients that arrive on the point of death. She was a sister completely in love with the Lord, and she transmitted this. She transmitted this with great simplicity, very naturally. Sometimes, even with her daring sense of humor, she transmitted the Lord. She was a revolutionary, to tell you the truth. Because she arrived here, the people were a little sad, and when she left, everyone was happy. In the hospital, there was a case that impacted us a lot. There was a man that was sick with AIDS in the last stages. And in addition to his illness, well, he obviously had had a very difficult past. He had been in jail. And Sister Claire started to tell him stories about her family, about Sister Claire's own family. And in that way, she was able to open that man's heart. Gradually, although rather quickly, she was able to get him to confess, help the man want to go to confession. He confessed, and then from that moment, he started to receive communion every day. Para él, el centro de su vida es la Eucaristía. Y le hemos preguntado el otro día, Romaco, ¿por qué quieres recibir la Eucaristía? Y dice, porque me da vida. 
y ayer yo le pregunto, digo, oye, ¿te pongo la música? Y él me dice, me dice, no, porque me quita el tiempo de la oración. <risa> Me encantaría si todos podían ver cómo es ese hombre, como digo, en la cama, con sus tatuajes, o sea, impresionante. Este es un caso que hemos visto en el hospital, hay, hay muchísimos, pero este ha sido uno que ha llamado muchísima la atención. Fuimos destinadas a la We were both assigned to the same community in Belmonte. We have a boarding school that is run by charity, and we take care of the education of the girls that go there. They are girls that have different kinds of difficulties, including family difficulties, economic difficulties. So we look after them. Basically, we, we play the role of their mothers there, and they love us a lot, and we love those girls a lot as well. Sister Claire was a constant surprise. We're always laughing, doing activities, joking. I never saw her sad. I never saw her upset. I don't know how she did it, but she was always happy. One thing that really caught my attention, and that for me was exemplary, and still is, was her obedience. I was really impressed that a sister that had been a servant sister for many more years than me, professed for a longer time, that knew more than me about everything, everything, and yet I never saw anything that she disagreed about, something that she didn't want to do. As a matter of fact, when the year was over, I still didn't know what she liked to do and what she didn't like. I could never tell. And when I asked her to do something, she not only replied, of course, but she was also always observing to see what she could help with. We went to Lourdes, and it was a very long bus trip. So as always, she made an effort to talk to the girls, create a good atmosphere, and sing. She started to tell stories about when she was little and to change her name so that we wouldn't realize that it was her. She started saying that it was about a nun named Sor Clor. She disguised everything as if she were a ridiculous hero named Sor Clor. She herself would say that she felt that our Blessed Mother wanted her to clown around for her sisters and for others. Someone could think that she wanted to be the center of attention, but that's not how it was, because she said that she would have liked to have gone unnoticed. However, she felt that her friendly nature, her sense of humor, and everything she had as a gift of God had to be put at the service of God and her brothers and sisters. When I arrived, I was totally depressed. In fact, later she told me that she thought I didn't know how to smile. And it didn't matter if she found you sad or if you were having a bad day or were angry. I don't know how she did it, but she always made you happy. When she made you laugh, it was as if everything else disappeared. She was very unselfish. She herself didn't matter. It didn't matter how she felt at any given moment. No one noticed it, but she had very frequent migraines. And I first found out because I found her throwing up in the bathroom. No, it doesn't matter, sister. There's a lot of work to do. Don't worry about it. But you would see her singing, playing the guitar, and playing with the girls. And I knew that she had a migraine. She did things as soon as she could. She didn't wait to feel better to do things. She just did them. I was also in Spain at that time when we would spend our summers in activities with young people, help out in Zurita. We had several construction projects. She was always, always, always willing to do any type of work. And in the summer of 2012, I remember right before going to Ecuador, we redid the roof of our first house, and there she worked with all of us, making everyone laugh and smile with her sense of humor. Buenas tardes, aquí estamos en Zurita. Hoy vamos a ir preguntando a las religiosas de las siervas del hogar de la madre qué es un funcho. Funcho. Oh, eh, ¿Qué es un funcho? ¿Usted qué piensa que es el funcho? Un árbol. Un árbol, vale, muy bien. Eh, ¿Usted qué piensa que es el funcho? <risa> es algo muy grande que va a sostener la casa. Vale. Cuando algo va a romper uh -huh. y deja un espacio, así. 
Okay. Muchas gracias. Este es el celo. <risa> Vamos a ver si encontramos más gente. Oh, aquí hay una persona. Eh, ¿Usted qué cree que está haciendo? ¿Algo para comer? Pero es así. Sí, pero... Sabemos que el zuncho es una palabra chino que significa yogur. ¿Por qué no el zuncho? ¿Puedo tener mm, yogur? En octubre de 2012, a month before she went to Ecuador, we were going to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. She wasn't going to participate in the trip initially, but she said to those of us who were going, you're so lucky, you're going to the Lord's land. If I could go, I would die of joy. A couple that was going to go on the pilgrimage had some difficulties and could not go. They said that they wanted to give their spots to two sisters. In the end, we decided to draw names from a hat, and the names we drew were Sister Therese and Sister Claire. And of course, when we told her, she couldn't believe it. She was so happy to be able to go to the Holy Land. Bueno, hoy la misa de, después de la homilía, todas las siervas y siervos del hogar de la madre hemos renovado nuestro sí en la casa de la Virgen. Entonces esto ha sido una gracia inmensa, poder decir sí donde lo dijo la Virgen. ¿no? Y aunque aquí solo somos nueve hermanas, aquí tenemos un papelito, por cierto, con todos los nombres de las hermanas. ¿eh? Todos los nombres de las semanas. Esto va pasando por todos los sitios. ¿eh? Ha tocado la casa de la Virgen, ha tocado la sinagoga donde predicó el Señor, ha tocado la, la mensa Christi donde el Señor ahí preparó el desayuno para sus apóstoles. Todo esto para que cuando vayamos ahí no decimos rezamos por la sierva, sino para cada una de vosotras. ¿eh? Para cada una de vosotras. When I entered as a sister in the Seven Sisters of the Home of the Mother, I did so to dedicate my life to God, and I knew that I had to be open to whatever the Lord asked of me. So when I was told that I was going to go to Ecuador, then I put my life in God's hand and, and totally accepted it. We had been doing apostolic work here in Guayaquil for a year. Sister Claire's arrival filled us with joy, because with the gifts, with the charism, and all the graces that she had, it was going to be a great asset for the community. I remember that everything impressed her a lot, especially the poverty. From the beginning, we were entrusted with two schools that are in very poor areas. Another big task that we have is teaching catechism in the parish. And of course, we have the group of the Home of the Mother and organize retreats, camps, get-togethers and weekly meetings. I remember how when we organized the catechism groups, when we got the names of the most problematic children, we sent them with Sister Claire. She was able to get the children really interested in catechism. It was something amazing because not all the children came with a desire to be there. I really like the song she taught us. She taught us about who God is, stories about him. She took us to the chapel. She brought me to confession and her smile. I'll never forget her smile. And when you finished giving classes, you were exhausted. It was really exhausting because of the heat and the constant effort of having to raise your voice and control 40 children. And during recess, what you wanted to do was get back and drink a glass of water and rest a bit. Well, it was amazing how Sister Claire spent the majority of the recesses in the patio still playing with the children. My first week here in Ecuador, I read an anecdote about St. John Paul II where he was on a, an apostolic visit and they asked him after a, a long day of uh, different activities, uh, Holy Father, are you tired? And the response of John Paul II uh, has given me a lot of light. They asked him, Your Holiness, are you tired? And he answered, I don't know. So that is an example of a man who has totally forgotten about himself to give himself to, to the others. A veces, claro, te cansa, por supuesto, el trabajo cansa. Pero eh, aunque estoy cansada, espero que, que no me hago la víctima y que sigo entregándome, ¿no? She started to direct the choir. What she most wanted in the first place was for us to be in the state of grace. Because if we weren't in grace, she said, this is no good. Secondly, she always reminded us, this isn't a stage. If you think you've come here to stand out, it would be better to get your things and go. You have to sing for God. You don't have to sing for the world or for yourselves. 
And you could tell that when she sang, she really sang to God and Our Lady. You could tell. She expressed herself through song, and also when she sang, you could tell. It was as if she came alive. She sang with all her heart, all her strength, until she lost her voice. And for me, that was how she lived. She lived giving of herself until there was nothing left, until she had no voice left, but with her life. She used to say, it's because I can't sing in a low voice, I just can't do it. And it's also a reflection of her life. She couldn't do things halfway. When she did something, she did it to the max. She did it with all her strength and kept nothing back. And so when she sang, she kept nothing back. And when she lived, she kept nothing back. Everyone knows how she encouraged, told jokes, and how she would come out of difficult situations and make us all laugh. But at least while she was here in Guayaquil, which we could say were the last years of her life, it was really hard for her to do these kinds of things. She was always willing to help out, but if she could remain hidden, she preferred to remain hidden. I remember how she looked for silence, and she always looked for times to be alone with the Lord. She was known for creating a good environment within the community. I don't know, sometimes maybe it's easier to create a good environment outside, with the young people, with a guitar, when you're in a meeting with girls. And sometimes when you go back to the community, it seems like you have a bit of a right to sit back and relax. But no, she dedicated herself to creating that good environment within the community. When I arrived in Ecuador, I was sent to the community in Guayaquil to take the place of Sister Claire so that Sister Claire could go to Playa Prieta. In the community of Playa Prieta, we run a school that has children from the age of three up to high school. She was my teacher and taught me English. And we would laugh. She taught me how to say modern English. And then she would teach us some games. After recess, during the last class periods, when the kids were all wound up, wanted to go home and all that, Sister Claire would come in, and with all the songs that she would start to sing with the guitar, the kids would calm down, calm down, and when they were all calm, when they were all tranquil, she would talk and talk and talk. Sister Claire would sing to us about the shepherd that lost his sheep. She taught us religion and English. English. She always looked for a way to help you understand. If you make up your mind to learn English, you can do it. You'll speak better than Americans. She always told us that. A very good teacher. She called us by our last names. Happy about everything. We were looking forward to Sister Claire's classes. We didn't want the class to end. We made the most of it, and on top of it, we learned. I remember seeing her walking during recess, and the children behind her, they would always grab the back part of her scapular. She always gave a pencil or notebook to each one of the kids so that they could follow along with her. And seriously, the children loved her. She never generalized. She was always focused on the individual. If she was with the children, for her, that one child was that child. She would dedicate time to that specific child. Many times at the end of the day, she had lost her voice because she was talking and singing so much. She was in charge of a very difficult class. They were teenagers, 14, 15 year olds, teens that were getting bad grades, getting involved in impurity. She was our tutor. She tried to unite our class. She called them my chickens, my little chickens. For us, Sister Claire was like a mother. She made us laugh about any funny thing. She would even juggle with the water bottle by moving it all over the place. According to her, she was juggling full scale. She put up with us a lot because we were really lazy and had a low academic level. She said, I think what they're missing is a motivation so that they can give more. She proposed to us a trip, but only if we started getting better grades. And that class started to get better grades. The whole class passed that semester. And we said to ourselves, how is she doing it? 
She prepared us with a novena to St. Narcissa before going there. So we did the novena, went there, and went to the shrine where she was. We thanked her a lot for having taken us there because it also helped us a lot. Since then, my spiritual life has taken a 180 degree turn. When they were with her, they started to bring out all their doubts. She encouraged us to go to confession and, and that changed my life. We all loved her a lot, even though sometimes she had to strongly correct us. She spoke to us really strongly about how we had to change this, that, the other. Yes, she always pushed for more, to give to the max, to give everything. She said, you know that I'm radical. Yes or no? Everything or nothing? White or black? But nothing halfway? No. No, she didn't like mediocrity. She gave everything and more. She gave it all. She said, it's because you're not getting me. And you don't understand how important the life of grace is. We can't put on a face in front of someone and a different one with others. Even here with your classmates or your teachers. You can't appear one way in front of your teacher and then later be someone else. She was convinced that every day you have to give everything and to say yes to the Lord because He asks you for something every day. Sister Estela, one of the sisters in the community of Playa Prieta, wrote some poems and she asked Sister Claire to put music to some of them. I Prefer Paradise is one of the poems that Sister Claire wrote the music for. She said, All of a sudden, the music came to me and I knew that it had to be like that, as though she had heard it in her head and knew that that's how it had to be. A few months before the earthquake, we had a conversation in the community about death. And I remember that we said, who will be the first sister to die? And what will her death be like? I could never have imagined that it would be the sister who is in front of me at the table that day. She knew that she was going to die young, even though I said to her, but how do you know? You're so much younger than me and I'm going to die before you. But she always insisted, no, I'm going to die young. Maybe I'll die when I'm 33, the same age as Jesus. She said, and lastly, I'm going to die young. I'm not worried about dying young. I'm worried about dying without having served, without serving, without giving all of myself, which is what the Lord has called me to do. She approached the sacrament of confession with an extraordinary purity and great humility. My fondest memory of Sister Claire is her love for Jesus and her desire for a greater perfection that she knew didn't depend on her own effort, but that she wanted to give out of love. She desired to love Jesus more, more and more. During Christmas of, 20, of 2015, the community of Jacksonville, we went down to Ecuador and there were 10 sisters. We had a sort of premonition. We were all like, why are all 10 of us going? This had never happened before. We just kept asking ourselves like, how did, like why did our lady do this and why did she make it possible? It's not something normal for sisters to just hop on a plane and go visit other sisters for Christmas and especially not 10 of us. So I think that made us live like our time in Ecuador in a very special way because we realized it was a really big gift from Our Lady. The last time that I saw Sister Claire, when I saw her, I remember thinking that she had changed a lot. Uh, she had completely transformed. It seemed like she was on a different level spiritually. To see her, for me, was like an examination of conscience. And I remember thinking, am I giving myself uh, totally to the Lord like she is? I looked at her with admiration and I said, Sister Claire, you are really, really giving your life here for Jesus Christ. She looked at me and without wavering she said, Sister, aren't we the spouses of Christ crucified? Finally, the trip came to an end and we said our goodbyes to all the sisters in Playa Prieta and then we went off to Guayaquil. And all of a sudden, in Mass that evening, I turned around and there was Sister Teresa and Sister Claire. School had already started in Playa Prieta, but Sister Claire didn't feel well and so she had to go see a doctor. And when Sister Claire came home, she called me to tell me that they had to give her an IV, they had to give her a shot. 
And she said to me, Oh sister, it was really hard. It was a really difficult situation. And she said, But you know what? Do you know what happened to me this morning? This morning when I came out of prayer, I said to Our Lady, Mom, today, everything. Today you can ask me for everything. Afterwards she went to one of the rooms. One of the candidates gave her the shot, the medicine that she had to take, etc. When she came out with a face as though nothing had happened, one of the girls asked her to start singing and Sister Claire grabbed the guitar. And so in that moment, I was going to ask another sister if she could play because I knew how she was feeling, but I didn't have time. Sister Claire took the guitar and started to sing. And I would say even more than sing, she shouted. I mean, she was again giving of herself totally. And I, when I saw this, I was touched to see her surrender. And tears came to my eyes, like now, when I remember it. And I remember that that was the last night that I saw Sister Claire. And it was very hard to say goodbye. All of us were a little emotional. And my last memory of Sister Claire is her giving, giving me a hug goodbye and saying, until heaven. On April 11th, 2016, the school was flooded. It was caused by a ton of branches that blocked up the flow of a river. They took the branches out, and the entire area of Playa Prieta was flooded in 10 minutes. What started at ankle length, not higher than that, started to quickly rise. At that moment, Sister Claire's face was like, I can't believe that this is happening. Because the benches and the chapel were floating. That week, which was spent in cleaning, I consider it a week of gifts. We were cleaning. We were cleaning the whole school because classes were going to start soon. As always, Sister Claire made herself available 100%. With joy, with an energy that I don't know where it came from. Well, of course, it came from the Lord. She started to clean and clean and clean. I was amazed at how quickly she did it. They had lent us a pump and we had to clean the playing court. Sister Claire had made a board with a heavy stick nailed to it, and it helped to push out the mud as they added water to it. So I was looking out from the window, and all of a sudden one of the men said, Sisters, on the count of three, you all have to go at the same rhythm, along with the candidates and girls that were there. And I saw how Sister Claire went running first. She was the first to run to grab the heavy board, to take the most difficult, the heavy board, which was the most difficult thing to push, and to start cleaning all that mud. But you can imagine. Of course, you're exhausted. It was almost time for lunch. They had been working all day long, trying to get the mud out from all these other different places in the school, cleaning seats, cleaning tables. I mean, you're exhausted. But you could see them with a joy, singing, laughing, saying, let's save souls. Come on, let's offer this for the souls in purgatory, for so-and-so. And it was something that made you say, it was a week that the Lord gave to them so that they could be prepared and go to heaven. Our community of sisters from Chone had spent the day with the sisters in Playa Prieta. And there had been a lot of families that had lost practically everything. And so we gathered the supplies to take to the families. And there the candidates, the sisters were working very hard. When we went up to the house, that's when I saw Sister Claire. And her face caught my attention. She was really beautiful. I don't know how to explain it. I remember that her face really drew my attention. Not just because of her joy, but because she possessed a special beauty. April 16th, the day of the earthquake, was a normal day. We were just finishing cleaning the little that was left. One of the library bookshelves fell on top of two of the girls. And so there weren't a lot of pain that day. And during lunch, Sister Estela said, what would have happened if you had died today? We were talking about death during lunch and about whether we were afraid to die. Sister Claire said, well, I'm not afraid to die. Why should I be afraid of death if death is the encounter with Christ who's the one I have always desired to be with? I said to her, no, not me, please, not yet. I, I need to go to confession first. After lunch, we went to Mass. 
and after mass, we came back home. And right away, sister said that we had guitar class. For a few weeks, Sister Claire had been teaching the girls how to play the guitar. That night I was going to sleep over, but I decided to leave and then come back later. Sister Claire was on the second floor with four girls. Sister Stella, Sister Therese, three girls and myself were on the third floor where our house is. Then I looked into the room, and that was the last time I saw them. I only heard the song they were singing, which was I Prefer Paradise, just a few minutes beforehand. I just remember their smiles, singing and laughing. The school is just five minutes from my house. Only two minutes were left for everyone to go down to the second floor to pray the rosary. I arrived at my house and the earthquake started. We started to notice that there was a quake. Sister Stella said, we, ha we have to get out, we have to get out. The house started moving more, more, and more. Sister Stella went running to save the Blessed Sacrament. I got to the door frame, but didn't go out. I saw how the stairs started to give way, as though someone were hitting them with a hammer. You couldn't stand on your feet, and so I grabbed the door. And all of a sudden, everything started to fall down. And in that moment, no one screamed, no one said anything. And we heard really loudly, dra, 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 dra. And the fall wasn't all at once, but little by little. And everything was silent. And so I started to shout, girls, sisters, but there was no response. We were all outside the church standing there. All of a sudden, the earthquake occurred and the sister's building completely collapsed. I said to myself, I'm going to the building right now. There was no electricity or anything. It was dangerous. The roads were really bad. And the only thing I saw was the terrace. It was as though a four-story building had never existed. As though only the terrace had existed. I, I just started to cry at that moment. I didn't know what to do. We started to call out to see if anyone was alive. And then Sister Estella answered. She said, calm down, calm down. Sister Trez is with me. She's fine. She's fine. Calm down. Don't cry. Instead of us calming her down, she was calming us down. And in that moment, we started to look for a way to get in and save her. We called the sisters in Guayaquil. We told them the news that the building had collapsed and that the sisters were trapped inside. And we didn't know what to do. You believe it because you're hearing it, but it seems like a mistake. We said that we were on our way, that we were going to get the sisters out, that they needed us, and that we were on our way. We went running home to our house. We gathered medicine, some food, water. And all of a sudden, I felt really strongly. Sister Claire, Sister Claire. I felt as though she was saying to me, I'm fine, don't worry about me. I'm just fine. And of course, I started to get worried. And I started to speak to our Blessed Mother in my heart saying, return her soul to her body, do something, but don't let her, don't let her die. And I felt really strongly, Sister Claire, Sister Claire. When I received the news, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. It was like a, it was like a nightmare. And, and so we immediately went down to the chapel. I, I called the rest of the sisters who were, who were sleeping. I explained what had happened and we immediately went down to the chapel to pray. I heard a pounding on my door. And immediately, I got up and went to the chapel. Justamente en febrero de... In February of 2016, I traveled to Spain, and I returned to Ecuador on April 16th. So during the earthquake, I was traveling with another sister. And my heart skipped a beat because I immediately thought of the building. I've experienced a lot of earthquakes in that school building and I know what it's like when there's a quake and you're on the top floor, so I could only pray. We got there around one in the morning, I think it was. The first thing they gave us was the Blessed Sacrament. We got there and they had taken out three sisters and two girls and had taken them to a house nearby. But Sister Claire and five girls were missing. We kept looking to see if someone answered, if someone was alive, but we didn't hear anything. They tried to break the concrete slabs that were intact, but it was impossible. We needed a machine to do it. And that's how the night was spent, without sleeping, without being able to do anything, waiting for daytime to be able to get the machines and work through the rubble to be able to find the sisters, waiting to see if they were alive. And right away, we went to be with the sisters that had been rescued and that were wounded. 
para poder estar, estar con ellas. Esa noche recuerdo que... I remember how that night we prayed the rosary a lot, and we didn't stop praying the rosary because we were thinking a lot about Sister Claire and the girls. They took care of us a little bit, and since we were doing really badly, and they didn't know if we had fractures or broken bones, they took us to Guayaquil for tests and to do everything else necessary to attend to us. I went with another sister and the injured sisters, and we took them to Guayaquil. And Sister Marie Carmen and I stayed back to continue looking for the sisters. I would say that up to the last moment, I had hopes of them coming out alive. At five in the morning, the earliest we could, we took the truck to look for a machine that could lift up the concrete slabs. We dug through rubble and more rubble. At around one in the afternoon, the body of Jasmina was found. I think that for everyone, we got discouraged. And time passed until... At around four or five in the afternoon, when it wasn't dark yet, they found the bodies of Sister Claire and the girls that were together with her. I think that they had run. We suppose that they had run from the room where they were practicing the guitar to the stairwell to go down the stairs, but they weren't able to get down the stairs. Sister Claire had a piece of the guitar in her hand. And they took Sister out and brought her to the assembly hall, which was in a little bit better of a condition and still standing. And we started to pray. Everyone gathered around their bodies and we prayed. One of the priests that was there also started to pray a song. And seeing them there at that moment, dead, I, I couldn't believe it. The truth is that I couldn't register that sister was dead. I was looking at her at the last moment while I grabbed her hand. I thought about Sister Claire and how she was there, even though she was with the girls and the majority of them were candidates. But I did think how she was there alone. There was no sister left there. The others, thanks be to God, we could rescue. And I thought about the motto of her perpetual vows, alone with Christ alone. And so I thought that the Lord had wanted her death to be also like that. Sister Claire belonged to him, and in a way, she lived that motto, alone with Christ alone, and at the hour of death too. Like Jesus, she died young, and because of Jesus, we believe that a life given in loving sacrifice is never wasted. There he is, a couple of troubles and stuff, there is a lot of depression in the town, and there's a lot of issues with drink and alcohol and drugs and whatever else, and uh, for somebody to grow up in that and then become such a, a vibrant person. This city needs something. It needs someone that they can say, this belongs to us. When you hear about stories about great people, you're thinking, no, they're great, I could never do what they do. But when you see someone like Claire, who grew up in the same streets as me, and you know, if she can do it, why can't I do it? And Sister Claire affected everyone in this city with so much joy. Because they say every city, every town has someone of their own. And the fact that Sister Claire actually was one of our own, people are like this, yeah. We actually pray this is to clear. And to be honest with you, I've done it myself. You go up to the grave, every day we go up to the grave, there's something new. You don't know, you never know who's going to be at the grave. There's a stronger relationship maybe now than there had been in the years when she was away that I hadn't seen her. I and mean, she's sick looking at me up there asking her for stuff. <laughs> every time I'm up, I'm asking her for something. I asked her to help people and help me. Or... Claire knows that I was never I'm asked, even when we were younger, I was always the first to fall asleep. But she always, always told me I needed to go back to God. 
I even started taking the wines to mass, but I never went to mass before. She might have to drag me out some Saturday nights, but I still will. So I'm going to mass now, and that's all down to her. What has happened with the school in Playa is like a parable of what has occurred in the life of Sister Claire. The school was destroyed. It was all desolate when I was there the first time. It was a sight to see all of the buildings in ruins. And now, after having returned and having seen how it's all been rebuilt, you can see how it's even more beautiful than before. It's a place of peace, of serenity, of beauty. And for me, it was a parable of what has occurred with the lives of the sisters, how apparently their death was a destruction. And yet God has taken out of that unimaginable spiritual fruits. We have received a lot of graces here in Playa Prieta, conversions. People are getting closer to the Lord. And we have the servant brothers here in daily mass. Here at the school in Playa Prieta, it's very easy to feel Sister Claire close to us since she spent the last years of her life here. I remember her a lot and I ask her for help to give myself as I saw that she gave herself to the Lord. And I asked her like Elisha asked Elijah, give me two thirds of your spirit. And I felt that she said to me, look at the heart of our Blessed Mother, which is what I always did. And that has helped me a lot. I feel her very, very close to me. Above all, when I went to Playa Prieta, I felt as if she were still alive. And she has helped me a lot. If it hadn't been for her, I wouldn't have gone to Ecuador. And right now, I would have been totally lost. This little sister who always wanted to be famous in, in another way, has, be, has touching hearts, many more hearts after she died than she ever could while she was alive. I can just feel her listening. You know, like I can't even describe it. I just know she's listening. You know, life is so short, and that the way she lived it, that's how we have to live. You know, every day just on fire with love for Christ. Because Sister Claire lived that way, that in inspires me to live that way. We are constantly receiving news here from people that, since they have gotten to know about the life of Sister Claire, they have become her friends, and they have taken her as a protector of their life and their family. A lot of people. We decided to name our little girl after Sister Claire. The, the death of Sister Claire is, is a seed planted in the ground, and it's just now sh showing itself. We are made to go to heaven, and so the fact that there are sisters that have already taken the path, and that by the mercy of God we hope are in heaven, well, for me, it's a great joy. I told the sisters that we have to be happy because now we have a foundation in heaven. We have a community in heaven. And I jokingly said to them that I have named Sister Claire as superior so that she can take care of the rest of her sisters. Look at Claire Crockett, this beautiful girl from Derry who left everything to follow Jesus and died tragically in the earthquake in Ecuador. But a girl whose life was totally transformed by her Catholic faith. She was changed by that faith and made her radiant and beautiful, made her someone that all of us can consider an example to be followed and perhaps a saint to be prayed to. It's una cosa que el Señor me ha enseñado de que el que pierde su vida y el que se olvida de sí misma y el que muere a sí misma es feliz. O sea, y esta es la verdad, esta es la verdad. See?